Life is always more interesting when you ask good questions, right? And there are definitely times in life when it's more important to have a good question than it is to, you know, think you have all the right answers because a good question will keep driving you forward. A good question will keep your interest going. It's, it's a wonderful thing in life to have some really good questions. And so we decided we'd ask the same kinds of questions a good journalist might ask of the Christmas story. The who, what, when, where, why... And then on Christmas Day, we're going to look at the how of Christmas, the who and the what we've covered already, who is involved in that first Christmas, what happened on that first Christmas, and today we look at the when. When did Christmas begin? That's a great question. If I were to ask you that, what would you say? When did Christmas begin? When was the first Christmas, for example, on our calendar? Now, some of you all this morning are saying, well, that's very easy. I can look at that very easy. Some, some, some folks are saying, well, I'm, you know, I don't know. When was the first Christmas on our calendar? I asked a group of junior high students here at the church this same question uh, last Christmas, a, a little over a year ago, and I was a little surprised that none of them really knew when that was. I said, well, just based on our calendar, when was the first Christmas? Is that Pastor Ray, come on, is this a trick question? How can anyone possibly know that? Maybe it's three or four thousand years. Maybe it's ten thousand years ago. Nobody really knows when the first Christmas was, do they? And so we began to look together at our calendar and what what those terms B.C. and A.D. really mean. And they learned something, and I learned something, and we learned something together in that conversation. B.C. of course means before Christ. We've dated history so that anything that happened before the birth of Christ is called B.C. And A.D. means Anno Domini. Some have thought that A.D. means after death, that we begin dating after the death of Jesus. But A.D. does not mean after death. It's Latin. It means Anno Domini. It means in the year of our Lord or in the year of the Lord in the Latin, strictly. So what it means is that when Jesus was born, it became A.D. It became the year of our Lord. Something fantastic happened at the birth of Jesus. In fact, so fantastic that we've divided all of history into two main parts. Life before God visited the planet and life since then. When was the first Christmas on our calendar? We would say 1 A.D., about 2016 years ago. On the other hand, those junior high students may have been on to something. It's true that no one really knows the exact date of the birth of Jesus. We, we celebrate Jesus on December 25th. Anybody know why December 25th is used? The days have continued to get darker and darker. Have you noticed that? The ancient people were really worried about that because if the sun keeps getting you know, shorter and shorter, daylight, is it going to be completely dark? Will the world be dark or will somehow the light return to us? And it's about December 25th that the days once again begin to grow and get longer and longer. And so the ancients said, that's a great time to remember the birth of our Savior who saved us from the darkness. And through Jesus Christ, light has come into the world. And, and in our world, the days begin to get longer once again. And we know that there's hope for our world. That's why December 25th was picked. It's probably not the exact day Jesus was born. But it's a wonderful time for us to celebrate. There's something about expressing our faith during these days that the, that the, that the light becomes uh, a part, once again, of God's creation, a part of our world. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Well, that whole system was figured by a, a monk named Dionysius back in 525 A.D. Since then, we've learned some things about the actual birth year of the Lord. You know that in Matthew we read that Jesus was born during the time of King Herod. We believe that was Herod the Great. Luke tells us that Jesus was born when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Now there's even some debate as to these kinds of dates, but most scholars believe that Quirinius governed Syria in 8 BC. And King Herod probably died in 4 BC. And so technically on our calendar, the date that Jesus was born was probably somewhere in year 8 B.C. and 4 B.C., somewhere in that time period on our calendar. So in a way, my junior high friends were right. It is very hard to tell exactly the year that Christ was born. But here's the point this morning, friends. For centuries, much of the world has divided history into two main periods. The time before Jesus was born 
and the time since he's been here. His birth was such a climatic event in the history of humankind that we've dated all of history around that singular particular event. The birth of Jesus, the coming of God in the flesh in Jesus Christ. When Christ visited this planet, threw off the robes of, of heaven, the royal robes, and came to be born in the dirt of a manger, the dirt of the straw of a feeding trough, to live life like us and to understand who we are and to save us from our sins. The key event in the history of the world, the time around which we date all the rest of time. We turn to uh, the Gospel of Luke this morning. You know that we find the details of the birth of Jesus in two Gospels, Matthew and Luke. And this morning we're going to turn to Luke chapter 2, not read the entire story, the, the entire birth narrative, but only verses 1 through 7. As I read this morning, you listen for clues that help us answer that question, when was Jesus born? The birth of Jesus. In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Luke, unlike any of the other gospel writers, wants to put the birth of Jesus in the time and the cultural context of first century Palestine. It's important for Luke, and we read in the very first couple of verses in his gospel, he wants it to make sense. He wants the story of Jesus to, to, to follow the proper chronology. He wants the events to, to, to follow the way they're supposed to follow. He did his research. He talked to people who were there. He talked to eyewitnesses of Jesus, people who had actually been there perhaps at the birth. In fact, Many scholars believe that one of Luke's sources for writing his gospel story was, in fact, Mary, the mother of Jesus, who became a friend of Luke's late in her life. And she was perhaps one of the key and chief sources of this whole birth story that Luke relates to us. I like that idea and uh, makes sense to me. But Luke did his homework. He wants us to know when Jesus was born. He wants to set it in the culture and in the history of first century Palestine. He thinks it's important and he wants to place Jesus in a particular time on the calendar. You see, this is one of the things that separates the Christian faith from many world religions. The Christian faith is based not on a philosophy of life, though we have one. It's not finally based even on a book though we definitely have a holy book. The, the, the Christian faith is not based on how you or I feel on any particular Sunday morning. It's not finally based on our feelings or the warm fuzzies we may have on the inside or don't have on the inside. In the end, the Christian story, the, 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 whole, uh, the, the whole religion of Christianity is based on the act of God. God breaking into the sphere of human history, not because we asked Him to do so, not because we wanted Him to do so, but because He came to find us. E. Stanley Jones said once that religion was the story of people looking for God, but Christianity is the story of a God who came looking for His people in Jesus Christ on that first Christmas long ago. We can ask, what was so special about that particular time in history? What, why did God you know, choose that time? Why did God choose the first century A.D. to, to, to break forth the way He did? Why, why then for Jesus to visit our planet? Well, we don't know for sure, but there were some good things happening in the world at that time that, that perhaps made it the right time. Now, many of you will remember in uh, you know, your your high school history class, uh, a date, 333 B.C., usually given as the date when Alexander the Great conquered the world. Alexander the Great and his Greek 
armies conquered the known world or all of the Mediterranean basin, even as far as Persia, and they not only conquered the world, but they spread Greek culture throughout all of the Mediterranean world. So much so that there was a common language that was adopted by most of the world in that day, at least the central part of the world, and it was Greek. During first century Palestine, Greek was spoken in most of the lands of the Roman Empire. In fact, if you want to read the New Testament in its original language, you've got to read it in what ancient Greek or Koine Greek, the common Greek of first century Palestine. Palestine. Can you see how helpful this must have been to those early apostles? Can you see how helpful this must have been to those early evangelists who wanted the whole world to know what God had done in Jesus Christ? When around the whole empire we can read the same language for the first time ever in the history of the world. It was a wonderful time for Christ to come because people could read about that great story across borders, of national borders and, and community borders in a common language. Secondly, this was the time, uh, again, draw back on your memory from high school history class, the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome. Yes, the Romans could be brutal, and often they were, and often the Jewish people were on the receiving end of their brutality. And yet, ironically, the Romans brought peace to the world because no one dared challenge their strength and authority in the, room, in the Mediterranean world. Can you see how helpful this must have been to the early evangelists? Can you see how helpful this must have been to those early disciples? The Apostle Paul can travel more or less freely across the Mediterranean world, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ because the strong hand of Rome had brought peace to the empire. Even if they were tyrants, they brought relative peace to the world because they ruled with an iron fist. Can you see how helpful this must have been to those early evangelists in sharing the good news, again, across national borders, across borders of culture and race and even religion? All the world could know the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, we can look at those kinds of things, the, the culture, the historical setting at the time of Jesus or we can turn to the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. I like this. Paul, rather than setting the cultural context and the date in history like Luke does, Paul says simply this. When the fullness of time had come, God sent His Son. Do you see what Paul's doing? He's looking beyond a date on any date on a calendar Paul doesn't care what the day was on the calendar or even what year it was. What he tells us is that in the fullness of time, in other words, when the time was right, when God saw that the world was ready, who can know the mind of God? But when God saw that the world was ready, he visited our planet in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this morning, uh, a secondary question, but one that I, I just have to ask myself when thinking about the when of Christmas. Has Christmas begun for you this year? Oh, I mean, I know the date is on the calendar. It's always December the 25th, right? And December 25th is going to be a Sunday this year. And by the way, don't even ask. Yes, the church is going to be open on Christmas Day. Of course, we'll have worship services, and I hope you'll come and, and be present. Someone said, can you wear your pajamas? Yes, you can. The only rule is we prefer, well, we insist you wear clothes. But we'd love for you to be here that day at, uh, at the Christmas services. But I'm not talking about a date on the calendar. I mean, has Christmas begun for you in your heart? Kathy and I were at the Tulsa Symphonia concert at TCC Friday night, and Leanne Taylor was the, the MC or the host of that particular uh, event. And she said Christmas never really begins for her until that Christmas concert. That's when Christmas begins for her. I've heard people say that Christmas begins for them in the church when we come on the Christmas night and we all decorate the beautiful Christmas tree. I've heard people say that Christmas begins for them when we finally light the Christ candle on Christmas Eve. I've heard people tell me that Christmas begins for them when they leave the 11 o'clock p.m. Christmas Eve service. When they leave, they walk outside and it's Christmas Day. And they say that's when Christmas really begins. How about in your home? Does Christmas begin when you put your Christmas tree up? Does it begin when you open that first present? Does it begin when the kids finally arrive at your home to share it with you? Does, it, does, it, does Christmas begin when, when grandma finally makes it to the house? When, when does Christmas 
begin for you and your home. The Greeks uh, divided time into two different categories. And some of you are familiar with this. I think we've got a slide She's talking about chronos and kairos. Kronos is, is time on the timeline. Kronos is that time on your watch. It's the time on a clock. It's the time in your cell phone. It can be measured and detailed and analyzed. That's where we get the word chronology. Kronos is that time on a calendar or on your clock. Kairos is a different kind of time. Kairos doesn't refer to what, the, you know, what it says on the face of the clock. Kairos simply means the right time. As Christians, as people of faith, we might call Kairos God's time. It doesn't really matter what time is on the clock. It doesn't really matter what time is on my watch. It doesn't matter what time is in my cell phone. When God says the time is right, that's Kairos time. When a baby is born, uh, you know, we usually detail on the birth certificate time and place of the birth. We put, a, we put a time there so everybody can know the date and even, even the hour, that that, even the minute that that child is born. But all of us know that what's on that birth certificate is just the surface. It's just the tip of the iceberg. The impact that baby is going to have on their family, the impact that baby is going to have on our world is what's next. That's Kairos. God said it's the right time for this child. And we believe that God has a purpose and a design and a use for every human being and every child, every child in this room and every child on the planet. Someday, when I die, there'll be somebody around filling out a death certificate for me. And it's going to have a time and a date. And, uh, you, know, uh, I don't, you know what? I'm not going to care one bit. Because for me, that will be Kairos. I won't give a flip what the day of the month is. I won't care at all what the clock says because for me it'll be a Kairos moment. It'll be a time when I go to stand before the Lord face to face. The right time. See, that's the difference sort of between Kronos and Kairos. We live mo so much of our lives on Kronos. I want to encourage you during this Christmas season, friends, to look for Kairos. Look for what God is doing behind the scene. To look for God, what God is doing not only on the clock, not only on the calendar, but in your life and in your heart. Debbie Reynolds sent me a beautiful clip of one of my favorite actors, Jimmy Stewart. And in this clip, Jimmy Stewart moves from Kronos to Kairos. You know, Jimmy Stewart is one of the most celebrated actors in American film history, Five of his films are on the top 100 list of the greatest films in all uh, American history. Um, uh, of course, It's a Wonderful Life, which a lot of people watch, is one of those. But he had many others. Did you know he was also a brigadier general? He served very honorably uh, our country in the Second World War as a bomber pilot. And went on to have a career with the Air Force. Well, uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, an Academy Award winning actor, Nominated for, uh, you know, best male actor, uh, uh, I think five different times. Says that in this following clip that we're about to see, he was the, it, was the, it was the most honorable piece of film he had ever filmed. Another amazing thing about this, when you see it, you'll see what I mean. It only took one take. There were no retakes. There were no cuts, no do-overs. He started on a roll, and he just went with it because it was simply what he felt in his heart. In fact, he would later say, I only had one of these in me. So let's go now and see Jimmy Stewart as a custodian, cleaning off his nativity scene, suddenly transported into Christmas. Hello there. 
deux. Custodian over the back apartments, but 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 you know that, don't you? You know that. I guess nobody here can see me or hear me except you. You. I didn't bring a gift. I but I. I guess that's not important. I. Thank you for everything you've done for me. I, as long as I can remember, you've been right by my side. I'll never forget when you walked with me right in those first few hours after I lost Mark. I, I've always been able to count on you when I felt dark inside and when I... And you were right there, right? Every time. Right there, even when I didn't feel good about myself, I knew that you cared for me enough, and I, I, that made me feel better. I, uh, like the time I got mad with Mabel Huntington because she broke her pipes on purpose, just so she could have somebody to see while I came up and fixed them for her. Boy, I hollered at her, like, boy, I hollered real loud. But then, then I got to thinking, you love Mabel just as much as you love me. And I should treat her the way you want me to. I, I believe I talked to you about that at the time. I, well, I started visiting her and we became friends. And I saw her all, almost every day until the day she died. I love you. You're my closest, my finest friend. And, and that means that I, I can hold my head high wherever I go. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy Stewart, for transporting us to Christmas once again. When was Christmas? When did Christmas begin? When was that first Christmas? Well, scholars tell us sometime between 8 and 4 B.C. But friends, let's not forget this morning or ever that when you open your heart to the Savior from Bethlehem, Christmas always comes again. Amen. If you're able, will you stand and let's pray together. We thank you, God, for your grace and for your love. We thank you, Lord, for Christmas 2016. We're grateful for Jesus Christ who came long ago and who still comes to us today. Lord, help us not to miss your spirit when you come our way. Help us, God, not to get so wrapped up in some of the details and what's the date on the calendar that we miss your visitation altogether. Lord, we want to open our hearts and minds and souls to you and to your spirit this year and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together hymn number 234, O Come All Ye Faithful. Let's remain standing and sing together. <laughs> 